Hello, everybody, and welcome to our morning session. Hope you've had a good morning and you enjoyed the social events, uh, all the warm up activity, and everything else on the programme. So, delighted to be able to introduce um, our first plenary of day two. And you may have noticed my sidekick here, uh, due to unprecedented demand from last year's uh, performance in Leeds, people were craving more banter between me and Vidya. So, delighted to have Vidya with us, who's going to chair this next session. Uh, Vidya Alexson is the Chief Executive of Power to Change, who most of you will know are our key partner and headline supporter of this convention. So thank you, Vidya. We wouldn't be able to put this event on without your support. So welcome. Thanks a lot, Tony. Great to be here and really fantastic to have everyone at Unconvention. Just a shame. I know you've all said it a hundred times, but would love to have been there in person. It's one of the best events of the of the calendar for the sector. But you know, this is going to, going to be great and really looking forward to this session on community power. So Tony, before you disappear, I just wanted to, and this is a big spoiler alert for all of you, so there is going to be a poll and it's actually I think going to go live now, so you can respond as Tony's kind of responding uh, in real time. It's going to be on the right of your screen. So the question everyone's going to be answering, Tony, which I'm going to pose to you before you disappear is, how positive are you about the current government's commitment to community power? So yeah. just in a couple of minutes, what are your, what are your thoughts? So I have a 30 minute answer to this, or indeed I can talk about it for I time. I don't want that one. I will try and give my uh, short answer. So I think there was um, there were definitely rooms for optimism, um, certainly at the end of last year and the beginning of this year before COVID struck, about the levelling up agenda, what that means. I think the fact that there are more government MPs in constituencies where we have a lot of very established members means that there's a greater connection in terms of the understanding of what our members do. I think there were definitely specific opportunities. So in the Conservative manifesto, there was a commitment for a new 150 million community ownership fund, the devolution white paper, the conversations that we've been having with officials and ministers seem to recognise that there needed to be more devolution at a neighbourhood and a community's level. Communities needed to be given more control over decisions that affect the economic development. I think since COVID struck, things have obviously been different for everybody in every way. Um, I think we've noticed quite a lot of um, uh, chaos in terms of officials being moved around from one thing to another to respond to the emergency, probably absolutely rightly, but it means that there hasn't been that continuity of thought about the agenda. I think we've seen things kicked into the um, distance because of the impact of COVID. So I think some of that progress is at risk of sliding away a little bit. And I think one of the things is we really need champions to promote how communities can really take control over decision making, over economic developments, and, and can play a better role in public services. So I'm going to be a, a very, very avid spect spectator of this session. I'm really keen to know what our uh, politician friends have to say. Fantastic. And we have some of those champions on the on the panel, so it'd be great to hear from them. So thank you, Tony, for, for setting that all up. So um, Tony's going to step aside into the audience um, and hand over um, so this session is really about the prospects for community power. So I think, you know, throughout this whole unconvention, we've been talking about um, the extent to which communities have been right at the heart of the pandemic response. So they have been and demonstrated the, their capacity, both communities as well as community organisations, which is you know, fundamentally sort of locality sits at the heart of that agenda, um, have been the front line of defence. So whilst we have clapped for the NHS and social care quite rightly, most of us thankfully have not had to rely on those services to get us through. We've relied on friends, we've relied on neighbours, and we've crucially relied on communities and, and the, the strong community organisations that we have around us. And we, you know, even though there has been some retrenchment in community spirit since uh, the heady heights of, uh, of June, we are still in a stronger position in terms of people's views about community, their views about whether they can rely on their neighbours for support, their views about uh, whether we as a society actually support each other and, and come together than we were pre-pandemic. So there has been a change in the country. And I think most people who are listening to this probably agree that communities um, need to play a critical part in the recovery, particularly if we want to see a more inclusive um, economy and society going forward where community power can be exercised by diverse communities and that community power is a way for all communities to rebuild um, and to move forward. And I think, you know, more than anything, uh, this pandemic has shone an incredibly bright light on the fundamental inequalities in our country, both in terms of race, but also in terms of geography. Um, so how can community power be a solution to building that better in a more inclusive way so that we become a stronger, more united country going forward? So, I mean, 
sort of very similar to Tony in terms of my view on the question. Um, you know, I've had real moments of hope on this agenda over the last 12 months. So Tony already talked about the community ownership fund that was uh, in the 2019 manifesto. I mean, that felt like a real sort of milestone to get 150 million pound commitment uh, into the manifesto. Obviously, we at that point, we had no sense that there was going to be a, a pandemic uh, coming that would cost billions of pounds. And, you know, it feels like the community ownership fund is now very much uh, on the back on the on the back burner so that you know that there's a a challenge there in terms of where are the, where is the money going to come forward to enable communities to take on those really vital buildings and spaces in their communities that give their communities character that bring people together and that drive local economic development i was also you know like many of us really heartened when danny's review was commissioned by the prime minister and i'm sure he's going to talk about that it felt like a real milestone to to get that kind of uh you know backing from from number 10 that this was an agenda to take seriously but there have also been moments of real disappointment um on the, on the same agenda so if you can think back to the budget in february which feels like i don't know a lifetime ago we were all expecting the community housing fund so something that had been really critical to driving forward uh, community-led housing across the country we expected that to get refunded and it didn't and it, it hasn't been subsequently um, it felt like the fight for emergency support for the charity sector and civil society as a whole was just quite hard that we were having to justify our reason for being what we actually contributed uh, more so potentially than other parts of the of the economy and i mean paul i'd be really interested in your thoughts on this i read the letter that the northern research group which i know you're you're part of sent um to the chancellor recently I was very struck by its focus on physical infrastructure um, and there wasn't really much space in that and for mentions of social infrastructure for the value of social capital in building communities and underpinning um, economic development. So it feels like we've still got some way to go in putting this agenda right at the heart of the government's agenda. So those are my views. You've heard Tony's views. So what are your views? So the poll results are in. So we've got only 6.3% of people positive. So remember the question, how positive are you about this government's commitment to community power? We've got for about 50% of people negative. And actually, most interestingly, 45-ish people percent of people uh, unsure. And maybe that sort of reflects what Tony and I have both said, that we've seen some great stuff and some stuff that has been uh, a bit more disappointing. And obviously, with a pandemic now, kind of, you know, shaping so much of what's happening within government and reducing bandwidth for other things, um, you know, it's hard to know where we quite are and how do we keep this on the agenda. So that is really the question for this panel. We've got an amazing panel covering uh, lots of the perspectives that we'd want on this issue. I'm going to do quick a quick overview of everybody and then we've asked everyone to speak for about three minutes, um, give their views on, on, how, on where community power is currently, how, what do we do to keep it high on the government agenda, uh, what's missing, what more can we do as a sector to change that. So first we're going to hear from Danny Kruger, hardly needs an introduction in these circles, but yeah, the MP for Devises, uh, the author of Leveling Up Our Communities, um, really a champion uh, for our sector in both when he was in government and now um, in Parliament, so uh, really look forward to what Danny um, is going to say. We're then moving on to hear from Benita Meta Palmer, who works as the head of partnerships at Engage Britain, a really fascinating new organization, relatively new organization that is trying to develop policy solutions from the grassroots using deliberative approaches and other approaches to try and get policy to be better informed by the views of people. Um, moving on, we're going to hear from Alison Haskins, who is the CEO of a fantastic community anchor, the Halifax Opportunities Trust, um, a, a really vibrant, sophisticated organisation that does so much in its community and Alison is also on the board of locality so we'll bring a really strong community perspective to the discussion and finally we're going to hear from Paul Howell MP who's the MP for, was elected in 2019 as the MP for Sedgefield. Um, he is chair, very significantly chair of the APPG on left behind communities and a member of the Northern Research Group which I just mentioned and Paul really fascinated to hear your views on where physical infrastructure investment and social infrastructure investment meet uh, in these left behind um, communities. So without further ado, all that's left for me to say is that as you're listening to people, do put questions up on the Q&A. So it's on the right hand side of your, of your screen is the, the box where you can put your questions in. And then when we move into discussion, I'll have a few questions for myself, but we'll, we've got at least 15 minutes reserved to take questions from the audience. So do please start adding in questions. 
Danny, over to you. Thank you very much, Vidya and uh, and Tony. And uh, as ever, very good to be with you. I um, it's always helpful to uh, just before you start have a poll showing that uh, m most of the audience don't believe uh, in in what you're about to say, which is that this government is committed to community power. But let me try and uh, present that in a way that's credible to those who who have have less faith. I mean, I think if the, if that poll was interpreted sort of if you interpreted it retrospectively in terms of how impressed you have been over the last year with the government's commitment to community power, well, I can understand uh, the, the skepticism. Um, but, uh, there, but, but if you were to ask me, does this government have in its sort of DNA, in its ideological uh, heart, a, a commitment to this agenda or potential commitment to this agenda, then very much so. And, uh, and and I'd give two sort of accounts of that, really, in the big scheme of things. Um, the first is uh, is is around the whole leveling up agenda, and it's great to have Paul Howell here, and, and he can say more about that from his perspective in the northeast. Um, but you know, this uh, my party. I've, I'm a Southern MP, uh, you know, representing a shire seat in Wiltshire. Um, but we not, you know, our party is in power because we won votes in the north of England. Um, I was, I was, 15 years ago, the candidate in Sedgefield, uh, which was a, you know, laughable proposition for a Conservative in 2005. Uh, but you know, Paul is here as the Conservative MP for that seat, and uh, so something profound has changed in our party, and or rather, in the country, and it's our party that has to make that change meaningful uh, politically, and to honour those voters, and. Uh, uh, it is my view, and, and one that I'd never find any dissent when I put this to ministers or people in number 10, is that levelling up is only meaningful if we address the social context and, the, and, and transfer not just wealth in the form of public spending and in, in, in infrastructure expenditure, but actually if we transfer power itself. Um, and. Uh, uh, and, and, and again, not just around, Paul can no doubt reflect this, not just economic infrastructure spending, but social infrastructure spending as well. Um, and actually, Boris's first speech that he gave when he was, came in as Prime Minister last July was in Manchester, and he talked about the, uh, not just about, when he talked about levelling up there and, you know, get, trains and broadband and all these important things for the towns of Greater Manchester, because he was making the point that central Manchester was booming, but what about the sort of hinterland of the city? Same, the same places that have, you know, deindustrialized places that have been disadvantaged for generations, um, needing investment in their social infrastructure and the quality of publics, the public spaces and the gathering places of those communities. Um, the, the, so, so there's leveling up, and then there's then the other great theme. And you know, you, you know, if you're interested in community power, you might reflect on the slogan of Brexit. Uh, and you can believe it or not, but this government does believe in in enabling people to take back control. And they recognise that that isn't just if if all we do is transfer power from Brussels to London, uh, we haven't fulfilled the the mandate of the Bre Brexit referendum. And and we really know why people voted for Brexit. They want to have agency. Uh, and that I mean that's local as much as national. So there have been some, I, I mean, given what's happened this year, I hope it's understandable why there hasn't been more progress. Um, and even now we're wondering where the devolution white paper is, where the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is, but there have been important steps and I hope my report reflected uh, some of the opportunities there. I couldn't agree more about the need to get the Community Housing Fund uh, back on track and the Community Ownership Fund uh, commitment delivered. So I'm pushing very hard for that and we can all work together on that. But let's pick it up more in the questions. Back to you, video. Great, thank you very much, Danny. Um, and, uh, you know, we can, I think the pandemic has to account for, you know, has to be an account for some of what's not happened. So we all appreciate that, I think. Um, moving on to Benita, what's your thoughts? Thanks, Vidya, and thanks to Tony at Locality for inviting me here today. Unlocking the power of communities is key to building back better as a society. There's a huge opportunity for government and policymakers to embrace the innovation on the ground and shape the policy agenda with genuine people power. As Vidya mentioned, Engage Britain is a new politically independent charity which wants to help produce better policies. We were founded from the realisation that key challenges haven't been solved by politicians for decades. Indeed, finding answers to the biggest questions aren't necessarily compatible with the electoral cycle. 
So at Engage Britain, we believe that communities must be at the heart of finding ways forward on the biggest challenges that we face. Our nation is at its best when we engage with each other and great ideas which reach across divides and improve lives will come from combining our different views, knowledge and experiences. Britain faces a host of challenges, such as sustainably funding health and care, providing opportunities for families living in poverty and protecting the environment. Some challenges we know are fundamentally divisive, like immigration. Others, like the coronavirus crisis, affect us all, whilst highlighting the problems that we've left to fester. We want to test whether better policies will be possible, not by starting Westminster, but deep in communities up and down the country, talking to those who bear the brunt of these policies, who work within the systems which put the policies into practice, and those who have the energy and ingenuity to do things differently. I feel I can say this because our founder and director spent two and a half decades in Westminster within the Prime Minister's Policy Unit and Whitehall. So this is based on first-hand experience that things need to change. Having personally represented my own community as a, a local councillor, I sincerely believe in putting citizens and communities at the centre of compassionate and sustainable policy making. So we want to speak to those who are often unheard in conventional policy making to help reveal the ideas that really work for people through a co-design process produced in partnerships with policymakers and politicians, as well as charities and communities. We're starting with health and care. We found this was the top issue from our polling, the biggest issues facing our country, according to people themselves in 2018, 2019 and 2020. We as Britons are perfectly capable of understanding the challenges that we face, of engaging decently with each other despite our differences, and of finding sustainable ways forward that reach across divides. We need everyone to get involved in making these vital decisions about our lives and our society, and we need to act now. So my answer to whether the government can support a community-powered future is that it's no longer just an option, it's essential. Thank you. Great, thanks, Benita. Strong finish there, like a rallying cry for why this really matters. So thank you. Um, before I pass on to Alison, just a reminder to those of you that are in the audience, do submit questions. I can see no questions so far, so uh, that's not going to make my job very easy in the Q&A. So do submit questions. Uh, we will be taking audience questions as well as questions from uh, the chair. So uh, do, do do that while you're listening. Um, Alison, over to you. Thanks, Vidya. Um, okay, so as Vidya introduced me, I'm Chief Executive of Halifax Opportunities Trust, which is uh, based in Halifax in Calderdale, which is West Yorkshire. Um, just very quickly, uh, we're a typical locality member, I would say. We're a community anchor. We're based um, in a particular neighbourhood. We run a whole variety of buildings and um, activities. So we have business centres, we provide employment support, adult learning, we run children's centres, nurseries, um, and social activities as well. Um, we try and make them work together. So we take contracts from national and local government, we get grants um, and we trade, and we try and provide a seamless um, approach to how we work in the lo local community. Uh, we're quite large, uh, five million pound turnover and about 200 staff. And that actually makes us one of the largest employers in Calderdale, which has a lot of um, SMEs. And we're an important employer for um, our, lo our particular local community that we're based in, which has um, a population of about 70% which have um, Pakistani heritage, um, quite a lot of people who come from Eastern Europe, and it's um, an area of settlement for asylum seekers and refugees. Um, we were set up very specifically to be a regeneration charity addressing um, poverty 20 years ago, and my goodness me, the last six months have really shown us very starkly uh, that inequality and disadvantage have led to much worse outcomes for our community and actually in many communities in, in the north of England. Um, like very many, like, like all locality members, we're absolutely committed to our place. We're there for the long term. We have a constitution that commits us to Calderdale. Um, we've got a profit lock, we're a charity. So everything we do is about the place. Um, all the money we bring in is spent in the place and it recirculates around the place. So we believe we're an important 
source of economic, uh, community-led economic regeneration. And that's why I'm very excited by some of the things that I've read um, from Danny's report, uh, the, uh, the intent he's already expressed this morning, and I'll be really interested to hearing from Paul, because actually um, physical infrastructure is important in communities. I think the issue is who owns it and who benefits from it. Uh, that's really crucial. Um, Organisations like Halifax Opportunities Trust, we do not sit like oil on water in our communities. We, we are part of the community and I really can't stress that enough. Uh, we, we are drawn from that community as staff, as volunteers, um, as trustees. Um, our own staff take part in the communities we offer, so it's a very permeable um, situation, and I think that's one of the um, unique selling points, really, of organisations like ourselves and of other locality members. And in many ways, we, we just get on with it, quite frankly. Um, Central government particularly feels very far away sometimes. Sometimes it's uh, great and schemes come out and we benefit from those. Sometimes we get very frustrated because... Um, the way things are designed, particularly at central government, seem to just forget about neighbourhoods and they make it more difficult. And I think that's one of my key points I'd like to say today is we're a great resource um, for any government, current government, future governments, whatever, to get resources and opportunities deeply into, uh, into local communities. Uh, we're there for the benefit of the community. So, you know, we, we're, we're constitutionally, constitutionally committed. Uh, we are not going to waste the money. We'll really make it work. We, we carried out an, um, uh, something called an LM3 calculation for Halifax Opportunities Trust to, which found that for every pound we spent as an organisation, because we spend locally and because we employ local people, that pound recirculated around the community uh, three times and created two pounds 43 pence of uh, local economic benefit. So that's a real uh, multiplier, economic multiplier effect, which can't be um, ignored, I think. Uh, we're a real living wage employer, so we, as I said, we employ a lot of people. We're probably one of the largest employers, actually, of certain communities, uh, particularly South Asian women in, in um, Calderdale. And the good news is that we pay good wages and we have very decent uh, conditions for our employers. So it's not just what we do there, out there in communities, it's how we do it um, as an organisation. Um, but as I said, it does feel frustrating sometimes. It does feel sometimes locally is bypassed or given crumbs. We're sort of constantly on the end of chains, whether they're um, prime contracts for huge areas like the north of England, and we're at the very bottom of a long supply chain, where quite frankly, a lot of the profits have been extracted before they even reach us, and that can be really frustrating. We also feel we constantly have to sort of prove our worth, despite the fact we have assurances from Ofsted Matrix, Quality of Health, that we're a well-run organisation and we produce an annual report every year to, sh to show how well we do locally. Um, we have been impacted by the cuts to local government. Uh, when local government catches a cold, or I can't remember which way around it is, or sneezes, we catch a cold because we do have contracts and grants. So the years of austerity have had an impact and it doesn't matter how enterprising you are, which we are as an organisation, about a fifth of our income is through trading. Um, we are impacted by some of the cuts to local government. So it's, I'm delighted that suddenly huge amounts of money have been found by the current government. And I hope that that... Um, uh, that continues to some extent. So what I'm, my final message really to say is that we're ready, willing and able to ensure resources and opportunities get directly into local communities and every penny is used. My very final mes message is we need government, central government and local government to provide moral, compassionate and dignified political leadership for the country and to do the best for all its citizens. It's remembering that the impact of what is said uh, how it plays out on the ground, because we're the people that pick up the pieces sometimes from the political um, fallout. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Alison. I loved your phrase. We don't sit like oil on water in our communities. You know, we're deeply embedded. That's really, I think it's a brilliant way of describing how you how you are, you, you and your community are knitted together. Um, that's really, really powerful. Uh, Finally, but by no means last, at least, uh, Paul, uh, we're gonna, we've already talked a lot, Paul, about uh, the importance, Danny mentioned the importance of the new entrants in 2019. You're, you're one of them, the significance of uh, the, the Conservative Party now having a, a, a significant foothold in the North, um, and obviously the levelling up agenda being kind of central to how we want to go forward as a country. It'd be great to have your thoughts on, on that for a few minutes. Yeah, thanks, Vidya, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, 
as a new MP, um, and uh, unlike Danny, I don't have a history of being in Parliament and, uh, and working the, the mechanisms of that. Um, I spent you know, 40 years working in industry, so my main background you know, is about understanding business and understanding you know, how supply chains and accounts and things like I'm a financial director by training. Um, but once I've got into Parliament, you then have to look at what you want to do and what you want to actually participate in, and you gravitate to the things you know, so therefore... You know, for those that don't know, I'm on the base select committee in terms of that side. But then you obviously are looking at what the constituency wants and where, where, where that starts from. And one of the first opportunities I was given uh, when getting into Parliament was to be involved and become the chair of the, um, the community, you know, the, the APPG for, for left behind communities. Um, I'm not even an expert of knowing what an APPG was at that time. I'll be quite frank with you on that. You know, um, I worked up until 2016 in, in, in business. My community engagement wasn't brilliant in terms of that time. I freely admit that. My wife is my social conscience, if you like. Uh, she's a, a serious volunteer and has been for a lot of years with Samaritans. Um, but I then had two years in local government where I'm a councillor in Durham and Darlington uh, councils and really starting to understand you know, the, 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 some of the frustrations that go on I mean, in business. If I wanted money, I could go and get it. You know, I, I talked to my shareholders or I talked to my parent company and I got it. Uh, one of the big challenges in, um, in government, whether it be local government, national government, is find out where the money comes from and which pot you've actually got to try and apply to to get it. That's intensely frustrating for me, I have to say. Um, but anyway, coming on to, um, you know, I was you know, selected and got the Sedgefield constituency um, last year. I've lived in this part of the world all my life. I am embedded here. I know the communities, uh, which I think gives me a great start as to, as to where we're at on these things. It's been a particularly frustrating year in terms of not being able to get out into the parts of the patch that I don't know as in depth as the others. Um, it's really been a frustration. Um, but to talk about the left behind communities work and, and, and what we're actually doing on that, you know, and for those that don't know, it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really about um, the communities that have um, suffer from a combination of social, economic deprivation, poor connectivity, whether that's physical or digital, um, but also community engagement, community spaces and places and, and all of this sort of um, agenda is where we're at. Um, and you know, I was on a call yesterday in, on, on, on our APPG there, and I, I resonated with one of the speakers who, who said, you know, we're not, it's not the left behind communities that we're talking about here. We weren't thought, thought about in the first place. We've just been ignored. It's not a left behind. It's a different thing. And I think people can understand what we mean by left behind communities, but I do get that the, you know, the, the different messages that come from that. But you know, it's a really powerful APPG. We've got around 60 members of parliament, including a, a number from the House of Lords as well, involved in that. And our, I, you know, the, the, the thrust is, is, I'm going to try and read this out because it's just the words that we've put together. So. Uh, it's, it's through the development and advocacy of hyper-local initiatives and policies to ensure that communities are stronger and more resilient in the future. That's what it's about. That's what we're trying to get to. Uh, I, as I've already said, I'm very new to Parliament, so I don't necessarily understand the best ways to understand government, but that's where people like Danny can, uh, can help me in terms of where I go. But clearly, you know, the roots are all about things like numbers. The more MPs and things you've got on board, the more chance you have of getting um, things pushed through. And similarly, it's about connections. The more connections you've got, the more chance of it is of getting through. So those are where we're working. We've done data dives on these communities and which were the worst affected by, by COVID. And clearly it's the ones without the social infrastructure. And you know, those that had people in the community that could go and apply for grants, at least had somebody to go and start things. So there's, certain, you know, there's a number of communities that don't even have that. So therefore they really are reliant on people reaching in. And there's no upward pressure in terms of trying to, to help them. So um, that was really a, 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 a finding that's there. Um, we've then got, a, you know, there's this others coming up. We've done one on social capital and infrastructure. That was the second session that we did. There's a report in, in due to come out on that. Um, we've got one coming on communities in control, which is about the capacity of these communities to, to look after themselves, whether that's because of just access to cash or whatever it is. Um, it is, is one of the future things. We've got another one uh, on boosting connectivity and the subheading for that is 
buses, beaching and broadband. So it's not just about the big infrastructure. You know, yes, you know, as a local MP, I campaign very strongly because I think that we need one of our railway stations back in place. But that's a long term exercise. It doesn't happen in five minutes putting a railway station there sorting out a bus route or sorting out a community centre and getting those things in a much more achievable short-term goals that uh, we're absolutely um, trying to deliver on and trying to work to. So um, I would endorse what um, Danny said in terms of believing that the government is up for it. I certainly am, and I certainly want to be a voice for trying to, to do things in there. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll look forward to, uh, to how this discussion goes now and, uh, and, and trying to find out more about organizations like locality you know i'll be honest with you as a local councillor i hadn't heard of locality you know i had, i was engaged with the community groups that you probably engaged with but i hadn't heard of you and you know i mind the depth of knowledge every day is a school day as they say in terms of picking up and understanding you know the, the, the structures and things that's out there and i'm really looking forward to the rest of today thanks great paul thank you very much and thank you for your honesty that was really uh really refreshing to, to hear and um, you know really really exciting to hear about the work of the APPG and kudos to Local Trust our you know a, a fellow traveller in the world of community power who has established the, the APPG so that is fantastic to hear so um, you know careful what you wish for <laughs> having said there were no questions there's now over 40 questions so uh, you know that was more, that's my fault for overstimulating demand but so we're not I will apologize to the audience um, in advance we're not going to get to all the questions um, but I think it'll be it'd be just useful to kind of kick off with a general question, I think, to, to all of you, which is, I'll start with you, Danny. Um, you know, we're, we're hopefully if the vaccine is kind of imminent, we might be moving into more of a recovery phase um, in the next uh, year. And 2021 might not be quite as derailed by the pandemic as 2020 has been. What do you think we need to do collectively um, to get to ensure that community power can get back on the agenda. So if we're all in agreement that it has been necessary for attention to be diverse elsewhere, what, what is it that we now need to do and what part can we each play in that? I um, had a uh, online public conversation this week with Robert Putnam, the American writer who's written about civil society for many years. And he he's written a book about how America in the late 19th, early 20th century came out of a period of terrible polarization and social injustice and sort of economic and, and cultural collapse really uh, to, to become a much more unified country over the first half of the 20th century. It's now all gone down wrong again. So he's talking about how can we, how can we rebuild in America and a lot of the same lessons apply to us. And his insight from 100 years ago is that what happened was two things. One is um, bottom up action, uh, a huge number of local initiatives uh, led by businesses, but also civil society. Uh, basically demonstrated a better way of working. And the other thing that happened is the parts of the elite basically woke up to their social responsibility. Uh, and you had a, just a shift in the culture at the top. And that's the, those are the two things I dream of and, and see happening in lots of ways. So we need to, more of the sort of action that we, we're, we're familiar with um, and, and the locality champions. Um, and we need to emphasize the you know, responsibility of people with wealth and power to uh, fulfill their obligations. And I just think a kind of cultural conversation around those two obligations are, are, are it. More practically, more practical answer to your question, Vidya, is um, I just think we need to, to, to build on the point that Paul just made about the evidence showing that the places with uh, high social infrastructure, even where there's economic disadvantage, have fared better through this crisis. And the more we can, I mean, I'd be interested in the evidence on that because I really think that could be very, very powerful with my colleagues, our colleagues, to see the power, see the importance of that, um, both economically and sort of on health and uh, other social indicators to, to demonstrate the value of social infrastructure. Great, thank you. Paul, do you want to pick up on anything more on that? Um, you know, you've obviously started to build. Sorry, I'm on mute. Paul, do you want to try and do you want to pick up on anything more on that? Because I know you're already starting to build this this evidence base, and I know um, from stuff that we've seen that it's been interesting that uh, although emergency funding has been trying to kind of buck the trend in a way, actually it's it's replicated patterns of capacity. So where there has been strong capacity and more emergency funding has gone in, organisations, <laughs> those will be your building works, from Paul. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to suggest you can you can hear them. They've decided to get the drill out just while we're talking. Yes, but, uh, 
But go ahead. Um, any more you want to add on on the evidence sort of case? No, I, I think, um, you know, the one thing we I'm, I'm trying desperately to do, and I think it's, it's very difficult um, in, in, in government forums, is for the APPG not to be just a talking shop. You know, it needs to be something that actually comes out with concrete um, ideas and recommendations. And I'm trying to um, you know, do whatever I can to, to work with, you know, whether it's Danny or anybody else that have, um, you know, similar or crossing over agendas to make sure that we, we maximize the potential for impact in terms of what we're doing. Um, you know, I think that, um, oh, sorry, my screen's just gone off. Can you still hear me? Okay, um, sorry, my, my screen's just gone. Uh, give me one second. Da, 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 da. Right, it's, as always in these things, this, the uh, iPad I'm working on just decided it wanted to do an update. Um, I've just told it, it, it's not. Um, <laughs> but um, no, it, it, it's about trying to engage with the different people that can, can do that. It's about me trying to you know, get with people like yourselves, get with people like Local Trust, and make sure that um, you know, the people that do uh, make the policy decisions get the influences from, uh, from people th th as to where it is. I, um, you know, as, as I said, you know, walking through the doors last December, I didn't know where to start. And I'm just trying to find the doors to open to, or to, to knock on and open them to, to do things. And, uh, you know, I am a passionate believer that, um, you know, it, it's the small community groups that, go, that make the difference for us having, um, you know, communities that work and communities that can survive and communities that can help people and, uh, it, it, it's how you engineer that and how you do it. I'm not an expert on the subject. I'm trying desperately to learn about it and uh, and then and then support the people that know better. So, you know, again, I am just reiterating what I said earlier a little bit. You know, we've got the our APPG. Please come and join us and uh, and influence us and uh, and see where we can uh, work together on this. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Uh, you might regret that given what, what happened to me when I asked the questions, you might be inundated now, but there are a lot of people on this call I know who can, can help you with that. Um, I'm just going to uh, come to Alison um, before we move on to another question. Um, Alison, like Danny was talking about the importance of, you know, like sort of almost the explosion of, of community level activity as part of moving to a different way of doing things. I suppose from your perspective, that might feel a bit rich and that you've been there doing this for a long time and actually what you I suppose you often feel is the need of support rather than um, you know let's do more and, and kind of uh, that sort of perspective so I was just wondering how it feels from your perspective um, sort of on the ground. Um, yeah we've, we've been there for quite a long time as have many of the community organisations and we're there and I've, I've, I've never felt somebody like Danny doesn't recognise that um, I think I'd just like to go back to a point, and I can't remember if it was Danny or Paul that said this, but, you know, when you have got existing infrastructure, community infrastructure um, in a place, it is easier without doubt to pull in resources, um, but we st we still need to have those connections to what I call the big ticket items, you know, whatever we, we say as an organisation do, and, we, you know, we clearly think we make life better for people living in the areas that we work in. Um, we still need for those, you know, there's still people who have got really poor health, who are unemployed, who are in um, gig economy jobs, uh, who dis experience um, discrimination, racism, you know, you name it. So, it's something about working hand in hand with with central government with local government um and that is easier in places where there are organizations like halifax opportunities trust i think one of the big questions for me is how do you how do you bring about that sort of infrastructure in places where it doesn't exist um, there has been a lot of work um, around this in the past and one of the things i mean i've worked in this sort of world for about 25 years now um you can't create it artificially if there's one thing i learned and Yesterday, Joe Montgomery was um, speaking, who led a lot of the Labour government sort of um, community development work. And during that time, I think there was a lot of sort of art artificial initiatives created that just died. You know, once the money went, they died and went with it. 
So it's a, it's quite difficult. How do you stimulate genuine organic community development in areas where it doesn't currently exist? And it's, it's, a, it's a complex piece of work, but the key thing I've learned certainly is you can't just drop it in. It has to come from the people that are there. Yeah, I think that's that's it, clear from the evidence um, that it's got to be it's got to grow from the grassroots. It's got to be owned by local people. I mean, at Danny's point about like it or hate it, the take back control. There is there is a sense in the slogan of the importance of agency in in terms of people's ability to control what happens in their place. Um, I'm going to move on to start taking questions from the audience. Um, people are up voting questions, so I'm going to be sort of asking the most popular questions as voted on by the audience. But Nisha, I'm going to come to you. Um, first with a question that was specifically directed to you and it's really about how you are going to listen to the unheard so um, if the remit of Engage Britain is to um, you know do more grassroots policy development and inform policy from local people rather than from just from Whitehall or Westminster how do you get to people who are not obvious who are not traditionally part of those processes you know what techniques are you using what experience have you had already that has proven to work be interesting to hear how that's working at your end. Sure, and it really follows on from what Alison just said. There are so many organisations that are already doing this and have been for many years that actually the way that we want to make this happen is to work in partnership with those organisations. We don't want to duplicate any work. It's, it's very important not to reinvent the wheel. So I think picking on all those good um, threads from lots of decades of work and making it happen with those actors deeply embedded in their community is how we see our ambition being met. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to um, one of the most popular questions. Um, the most popular one is directed specifically at Danny, so I'll come back to that one. But it's really about uh, the relationship between community power and devolution. So the white paper has been mentioned several times. It's sort of unclear to me, at least others might have a, a better view as to where that's got to and the extent to which it will really involve any su substantial devolution. But I think the question remains, so if community power is, you know, if we're all agreed that community power is part of uh, the answer and is essential, then when will we see more substantial devolution, not just to city regions, but to the local level and, and you know, not just to local authorities, but beyond local authorities? I mean, what hope can we have of really substantial shifts in power, you know, going forward? So as we move into recovery, are we likely to see a recovery that embraces, I think, what we've learned from the pandemic, which is highly centralised responses are not very effective. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of these responses need to be much more localised. Uh, you know, I'll start with um, I'll start with you, Paul. How, what is your feeling on the uh, opportunities for more devolved power? Um, I, th I think it's a, it's, it's a moving feast as to where you know, devolution goes. Um, I've, I've, I've listened to you know, different opinions, and I'm not sure whether I've come down with a, a one of my own yet in terms of... Uh, you know, whether you should be devolving things to you know metro mayors who are you know covering huge swathes of area or whether the, you know it, it should be at a more localized level i think there's a it's a debate out there for me in terms of uh, you know where that level of devolution uh, comes to um, but i do believe that um, you know there's a need to get proper devolution down to the communities in terms of the decision making and things that's there that almost bypasses local councils, you know, that, uh, that, that gets the community self um, engaged as to, as to where it is. It's that type of uh, devolution that, that, that comes down. And I just wanted to pick up very quickly on something Alison said in terms of, you know, how you get the, the things started in a community that doesn't have it at the moment. Uh, even from, as, as I've expressed, you know, my, my you know, naivety in terms of some of these things, that's exactly the question that I put at local trust in terms of the, the, the very first things that we started to look at. It, be, it was very clear to me that, you know, you, if you've got, um, you know, a community centre that's got people in it and engaged and that, that you can do something to build on that, but how do you start something that isn't there that's got a sustainable future? I think is one of the big challenges. I absolutely agree with you, Alison, but we are very much aware of that and trying to, uh, you know, to take learnings on it. Great, thank you. Um, Danny? What, what are your thoughts on that? And actually, I'll, I'll just pose you another question, just because there's one specifically uh, sort of asked to you, which is really around long term funding plans that are in the pipeline post March 2021. I'm not sure if you're able to answer those, but um, it's the top question um, of the of the list. So 
thoughts about kind of funding going forward and devolution would be really yeah. welcome, Danny. Okay, well, uh, well, devolution, I think there's a, I mean, I'm all for unitary authorities and metro mayors and, and city regions and everything. I, 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 I think that probably is the right direction of travel, um, not, but not a lot of our local government based you know, colleagues want that. Um, but others do. I mean, we got a bit annoyed with the mayor of Manchester recently, but um, we should get over ourselves, I think, and recognise the importance of local democratic leadership. Um, but that, if that is on the on the back burner, I understand. You know, fiddling around with the constitution is maybe the priority for this moment. There is a better, in my view, model of devolution that is the one that I think we share, which is a more organic, probably messier, much more local uh, method of public engagement that uh, empowers communities much more directly in, in, in social action and in, and in taking responsibility for neighbourhood life. And that is a both an, kind of more opaque, as I say, messier, harder to define agenda, but it's also one that I think we can just get on with. A lot of it doesn't even require legislation. Some, some things do. I mean, I, would, I proposed, I think inspired by, um, uh, partly by Tony and others, um, a, a Community Power Act, but that parliament to, to actually put a responsibility on public bodies to give back, give away power and control. Um, but even without that, we can do all sorts of interesting stuff using the Localism Act from 10 years ago and other bits of legislation and just not stuff that doesn't require legislation at all. Public service reform. You know, we've seen something amazing happen in, in the health service this year. We need to accelerate a lot of that new flexibility and, um, and connectivity in places. So I think there is um, activity that can happen. Um, uh, uh, even without a big devolution agenda. Um, on money, yes, sorry, I can't. I mean, yes, of course we should be. I, I have a dream of the dormant assets, then there's two billion pounds that I think should be a, you know, will form some kind of glorious endowment for communities. That's that's my vision for that that I'm, I'm advocating for. I think there was good news today. I don't know if you, anybody noticed uh, yesterday, um, the High Court has judged that the National Fund, which is 500 million quid sitting dormant 100 years, I mean, growing for the last 100 years, now 500 million pounds, not a penny has been spent um, uh, because it's all supposed to go on and paying off the national debt, which is not going to do, uh, especially what we've done to the national debt recently. Um, but that money can now, theoretically, the court has ruled, be, be, be applied to different purposes. And so I'm advocating strongly for that to go to civil society uh, and, and social infrastructure. So there are, I think, opportunities. There's the UK Share Prosperity Fund as well. Um, so uh, yes, reason to be hopeful, but I'm sorry, I have no powers of prediction about what the Treasury will do. Great, thank you. Yeah, we, I did see the, the National Fund announcement and I think you know we would really support your proposal in your paper that it should go towards the Community Renewal Fund um, or at least in part towards the Community Renewal Fund. Um, Alison, turning to you, I just wanted to add in another dimension to this question around devolution, which is really around local authority. So one of the questions asked, so we're talking about pushing power down, but one of the questions asked is really about sort of local authorities' views on, on community power and how do we get local authorities to embrace community power more. I think, Alison, you're lucky in working in Calderdale that you have quite an enlightened local authority in terms of community power, but just be interesting in your thoughts on you know, if power is pushed down, how do we also ensure that local authorities take this agenda more seriously? Um, yeah, we, we we do have a pretty good relationship with Calderdale Council. I mean, it's not perfect. You know, some things we get irritated about, and I'm sure they get very irritated with us at times. But you know, that's 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 life, and that's relationships, isn't it? Um, I would say if local authorities don't engage with the opportunity for community organisations to, to support sort of really local decision making, they're, they're missing a trick. Um, we're often, you know, the, the issue about democratic accountability is often raised, isn't it? Because obviously local authorities, and certainly in terms of the political side of it, you know, they're voted in, they have a democratic mandate. Um, so, yeah, and I sort of think, well, yes, that's fine. And therefore you can choose to work more closely with local community organisations as a fantastic way uh, to really understand what's going on in um, local communities. And I do think a lot of councils do recognise that. Um, it's not just recognising that though, isn't it? It's, it's having those conversations about resources and about um, who does what, do, do uh, services always have to be run by local authorities or are they sometimes better run by communities themselves so they feel more ownership um, of what's going on in their local communities. 
so for me it's it's presenting the win-win um to to councils about how they can uh, work with uh, communities um it, it benefits them it's what i said before actually in my sort of three minute uh, talk uh, you know it's what i feel about central government we, organizations like locality members and lots of other organizations that live in this uh, voluntary community sector sphere are just a wonderful way to engage with communities and it's it's not a sort of um, win or lose scenario it's it's using um, everything that's at your disposal really within the local place because if above everything local authorities are place makers and place shapers and i'm really pleased um, that that's being more and more recognized Great, thank you. And um, Anita, just be interested in your thoughts on kind of what you hear from from ordinary people in the work that you do. I mean, where where do people feel that power should be held? What do people see as the functional nature of the settlement we currently have, or do they see it as completely dysfunctional and it's too centralised? So, what's the sort of grassroots view on all, on all of this? I think Paul um, really talked quite convincingly about the fact that left behind communities aren't actually left behind; they're just unheard. So there's definitely an energy about how we haven't even been asked anyway. And people have that appetite to get engaged and see change made that reflects their views and the views of their communities, their friends, their families, their neighbours. So I think there are quite exciting things happening that are unveiling those thoughts and reflections. So hopefully, you know, we're one of those um, avenues to trying to kind of influence some change. So very, very keen to hear from anyone who might want to be a part of that. But there very much is that appetite. Danny talked about the take back control. People want that agency. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to a question on another one of the biggest societal challenges uh, currently, which is Brexit. Um, so, you know, bandwidth is being taken up by the pandemic more than anything, but also by Brexit as we head towards um, the end of the year. So it's really a question. Um, this will be sort of speculation, I think, from all of you, because I don't think any of us know what this is going to really look like. But um, Kind of fear i suppose from the questioner as to what the no deal brexit might mean for community businesses so um, many locality members and many of the organizations that pass change supports are you know trading businesses rooted in local communities supporting their local community to deliver both economic and social benefit for local people um you know i think there's there's been work that locality has done to try and prepare members for for brexit and the impacts of brexit but i would just be interested in thoughts i'll come to you alison first as to you know what are your what are you doing about Brexit? What have you been thinking, you know, alongside the pandemic? Have you had any bandwidth to kind of consider what impact it might have? Uh, well, we thought about Brexit before the pandemic struck. Um, and it, I, I've got to be really honest, you know, in many ways, it feels a, something that's quite far away because we do trade so sort of hyper locally. Um, one of the, some of the key issues that we thought for us, because we um, we employ staff who um, are from uh, Europe um, and we, wouldn't, we wanted to make sure that they weren't affected in any way and wanted to support them, both in practical terms, that they weren't going to suddenly not be able to be here and also sort of that they felt supported and we, we wanted them and we cared about them and, and they were very much part of our, still very much part of our community. Um, we were looking at things like supply chains you know and just will we be able to get the sort of practical things we need um, and and buy and actually one of the other issues was uh, food because we run nurseries so if there was any disruption of food supplies would that have an impact on our nursery so we upped some of the supplies that we keep um so it's a funny one. It's always difficult when you're when you're hyper local. I love that word that Paul used. We are hyper local to to really consider how something sort of massive um, is going to impact on you and not get caught short because it would be devastating if we didn't do our planning properly. So we think we've we've thought through all the issues um, for us, but it still feels it still feels like something that's far away and still difficult to really get to grips with what exactly it's going to mean for for our community where we where we work. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one final question just because we're rapidly running out of um, time. Um, and it's really about coming back to evidence. So, I, I mean, I, the question says, asks um, that the voluntary sector and uh, community organisations are often asked uh, to sort of justify themselves. So we have to sort of make a case for the uh, particular economic case for social impact we have. And whilst it feels like there is a lot of evidence and we all put a lot of effort into building that evidence case um, we're still sort of having to to do more and there's still a lack of i think uh confidence in the, in the case in some some quarters in in government 
So I'd be interested in very quick reflections um, from Paul and then Danny and Benita as to, you know, is there more that we could be doing? Are we actually, you know, are we trying to play the wrong game, you know, trying to justify things in economic terms that are fundamentally social? Um, quick reflections would be really helpful. Uh, Danny. Um, okay. Uh, yes, it's a very difficult one to get right because um, I, the, the, the key to unlocking more government money for our sector is for uh, the government to be convinced that, of the value of it. And we can't make that argument on the basis of existing evidence and we can make a argument from principle as well and from, from the evidence of what we can see uh, on the ground. But, um, but, but money um, follows numbers and uh, we need to get the data right. And I think our sector still has catching up to do on that. However, government has a massive responsibility to work so much better in terms of light touch uh, monitoring and uh, enabling better data collection and evidence making and I make recommendations around that. So I, I think the most the obligations on government, um, but uh, technology is enabling so much such better systems for collecting evidence and doing monitoring and evaluation. Um, and we can use old fashioned techniques of, you know, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with with more impressionistic qualitative evidence as well and government needs to be prepared to to take that. So there's a bit of a culture change in government, but let's not um, lose sight of the obligation on, especially if we're talking about taxpayers' money, to account for it well. Thank you. Uh, Paul, um, any particular thoughts from, from you? Yeah, I mean, I endorse what Danny said in terms of, um, you know, preferably a, a, a light touch. I think, unfortunately, you know, some of the big high scandals of money being put into the, um, the, the third sector and then being wasted or frauded or things like that impacts on things i think if we can touch the more local uh, things then the, the level of risk by going in with lots of little funds is a lot you know more spread than if you're going into with one big fund into for example so i, I, I do endorse that uh, we need to try and get more in that direction but again it's taxpayers money and i've spent a life as an accountant trying to justify you know where these things are at so i do get that one very quick comment on allison with regard to the supply chains and things I really, really support localization of supply chains. I think that, that coming back into communities, having more local spend and more local manufacturing and more local, 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 local um, is another one of the, of the stepping stones that might help us to get to a better place. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Arsene, I'm not gonna to come to you because we're uh, rapidly running out of time. So apologies. Um, uh, thank you all to the to the panel for a um, fantastic session and for the endless questions that I haven't been able to answer. I mean, I think we should, my view is that we should go, uh, go away from this session sort of uh, positive and enthusiastic and optimistic in that there we are, there is clearly a growing consensus among not just the panel and the audience, but, you know, within a whole range of different stakeholders of the importance of community power. We see it in what think tanks are doing. We see it in the, the numbers of MPs on the APPG. I think you know, we are, we may not be as high on the government agenda as we want to be, but we are ga gaining momentum. And I think we are gathering followers, if you like, on, on this movement around community power. So, so I hope some of those people who are not sure over the next six months to a year can become more positive. And those of us who felt quite negative uh, start to also feel more positive and we work together. And I think that's critical um, as a locality uh, and, and power to change have tried to do very much um, as, a, as partners and on this agenda. Uh, that we work together to move this agenda further up the government uh, priority list. So really, let's let's work together. Let's get this higher up the agenda. But I think we should be optimistic about the future. So a big thank you to everybody, um, and over to Tony. Thanks, Vidya. That was uh, fantastic. Really great uh, contributions from all of our panelists, and thank you very much. As I'm on the screen, I'll just kind of have a couple of micro reflections on that conversation. I think one of the things we experience quite often is that call for evidence is constant from civil servants in particular. Uh, and there's a little bit of a mini industry at the moment about our sector across all of the charity world and all the social enterprise world generating, in, uh, generating evidence uh, and then being asked again for more evidence without very much happening as, in that feedback loop which is a massive frustration at the moment and I think sometimes it's actually the stories it's getting the hook with ministers to drive through change within the bureaucracy I think that's certainly my experience over the last few months uh, and I just also say you know really emphasize what Alison was saying about 
community organizations are ready, willing and able, you know, they are professional outfits, they are major employers, they generate economic developments and they should be trusted. And just that point that Paul said, you know, fraud in the charity and social enterprise sector is minute. If we look at all the scandals over the last few months, it's the private sector where there's lots of fraud. So I just think we just need to be careful about assumptions about our sector. So thank you to everybody on the panel. That was fantastic. And um, that concludes our plenary session uh, for now. Um, the next coming up is, um, for those of you booked on the workshops, they're coming up next. So you just have to look on the uh, list on the agenda to find your workshop, enjoy them, connect with each other, and connect with each other also on the facilitated networking sessions. I apologize, but there was a small technical glitch this morning, which meant that the video chat wasn't working for a little bit, but it's all okay now. So you can uh, get on with those networking events. Uh, and then see you all later on for our inspiring TED Talk style talks. Uh, uh, the plenary session is going to start at uh, 10 past three. So we'll see you all then. We've got some amazing speakers, so do not miss that. Okay, see you all later and enjoy your workshops. Thank you.